Hi, I'm Candace Michelle, and this is Our Community. Before I introduce my guest and we start chatting, I want to acknowledge that a dismal episode in our city government looks like it's finally come to a close. As most of you already know from our coverage here, Brookings City Manager was arrested for shoplifting on July 4th, 2022. Instead of the dismissal that everyone expected, Ms. Howard was put on paid administrative leave for seven months until the former mayor, Ron Hedenskog, could figure out a way to bring her back to her job. He and the two counselors, Ed Schreiber and Michelle Morosky, that helped him in this endeavor were recently recalled from their positions by frustrated Brookings voters, and a new council was installed. On Tuesday night, January 16, 2024, the new city council voted unanimously to terminate Ms. Howard's contract without cause, effective immediately. The voters in Brookings spoke loudly, and the new city council paid attention. I don't celebrate anyone's misfortune, but I have to be grateful that the voice of the people was finally heard. And I hope this ushers in a new era in our city's politics. Okay, my guest for today is once again the amazing Executive Director of Brookings Core Response, Diana Cooper. Hi, Diana, and welcome back to the show. Hey, yeah, I was just thinking uh, when the last time I was on here, I can't, it's been... It's been weeks. Yeah. Yeah. Remember before, I was kind of on here every week, and then now, you know, a lot's been going on for both of us. A so. lot has been going yeah. on. Yeah. Oh. yeah. It's been a minute. <laughs> <laughs> well, the holidays have come and gone, and the gone part is really great as far yeah. as I'm concerned. <laughs> you know? Life can kind of get back to a semblance of normal, but... Yeah, yeah, maybe not I, for I all like of us. The, I like the uh, calmness of it sometimes because everybody sort of calms down. But if you're actually trying to get work done, you can't get a hold of anybody. So it's it's a double-edged sword there. It it really is just yeah. kind of weird, yeah. you know? Like you, you reach out to this organization and there's nobody answering yeah. the phone. Or, a lot of a lot of kickback messages that they're out. And it's stuff, so which, bizarre. Yeah, you know, right? Again, then it's quiet and nobody bugs me. But um, Contact me after the first yeah, of the year. Yeah, yeah exactly. Exactly. And we've had some nice, fairly mild weather for most of December. It was Yeah, it wasn't bad. Yeah, it was kind of a nice Christmas holiday. It wasn't pouring down rain all wasn't the time. It wasn't cold. No, it was not. But lately, yeah, <laughs> we've been walloped by some of these winter storms coming in that are like, I mean, I, literally, yeah. I looked out my window today and it was horizontal. The rain, yeah, because the wind was blowing so hard. Yeah, and big drops of rain too. Yeah, it's been it's been uh, flooding in a lot of areas. There's yep, flooding all over 101, and yep, I know up north there's some pretty severe flooding around Port Orford area. So, and if you go farther north, yeah, <laughs> you get snow and ice and inland. Yeah. And you've had some personal experience yeah. with that, unfortunately. It's not been a lovely January for me. Uh, oh, what happened? So I, I was on my way. There was a retreat up in Portland. Actually, it was up in um, uh, Stevenson, Washington, which is just over the border, maybe an hour north from Portland. Mm -hmm. And it's in the gorge, which, I, you know, I don't travel. So I, I didn't even know what that meant. Um, Excellent. Okay. And <laughs> so I had to go up to Portland and I'm Coming from the farthest city, there's people coming from all over Oregon uh, to go to this event. And this was last weekend it was supposed to start. And I left on Saturday. It was supposed to check in on Sunday. But since I was coming from so far, I, I drove a day early. And I have a friend in Portland that I was going to um, stay with the night and then just leisurely travel the next day. And so I spent Saturday just very casually driving. I was very careful and um, took my time, made a lot of stops. And I got maybe to um, about Eugene area and started hitting ice and some snow on the side of the road. And so I was very careful. And I, you know, I gave a lot of distance to the vehicles in front of me. And there were times where they had to kind of hit their brakes. And I, you know, had to hit my brakes. And um, and then when I got about 10 miles from my exit, I was so close. Uh, I, I slipped on some ice, my car slipped and I ended up 
I ended up very slowly coming to a stop in the left-hand lane. Um, in a, it was three lanes on I-5. And when I came to a stop, I, I knew, because there, there's so much traffic, I knew I was going to get hit. And one car tried to go around me, I think, and kind of clipped me from behind, and it pulled me out into the lane. And then another car just slammed directly into my driver's side door. And so I... Dear. I uh, I closed my eyes because I thought for sure that I was going to get hit more and that was going to be it. And and then when I opened my eyes, we were on the right-hand side of the road, just up against the guardrail. Wow. So I'm not even sure how we got yeah. over there without getting hit again. Yeah. There was so much traffic and wow. semis and, yeah. So. Um, Brutal. Yeah. And so, I've seen pictures of your car. Yeah, I left I left her up there. I'm The tow truck uh, driver asked me, if I wanted to find a way to get it home, and I thought, no, I don't, why, why? No. So I just said, well, you know, what do I do if I just don't want it? And he said, well, we'll scrap it. So right. I handed him the keys and got an Uber and left, went to my friend's house. I was there for a couple of nights to recover and went and got, um, financed my first car. Yay! Yeah, so I got a Subaru, which is much safer on the mm-hmm. snow. Um, my car did okay, it just... Yeah, that last bit I couldn't I couldn't get out of the snow. So this one is specifically rated for snow and ice. I got a 2015 Subaru and uh good. Yeah, it was a much safer drive home. So your body, how how I mean, oh, when yeah, I look no, at that your was, car, it's yeah. I think it's kind of a miracle you walked away. I probably any any heavier of an impact and I would have had some in some major injuries. Um, as it was, it pulled my left arm pretty hard, and so I think had it had they been going any faster, it probably would have broke my arm. And then, um, yeah, the inside panel snapped and um, kind of bashed me in the ribs and the hip, and so I had I still have quite a bit of bruising on my left side and had a couple of bruised ribs and uh, somehow injured my left foot. I'm not even sure what that's about because <laughs> my foot was on the floor. In the wrong so, place at the wrong time. Yeah. <laughs> and then somewhere in all of that commotion, I lost my glasses. And when we got to the tow yard, I realized I was not wearing my glasses. And so I searched all around in the car. It's kind of hard to see because everything was sort of bashed in. So I couldn't really right. look around. So, right. yeah, I couldn't find them. So I uh, made it back Monday, though, with without. I mean, I can still see. I just, right. you know, have to squint. But you also got checked out while you're up there. I right? did. I you went, went to Kaiser, Kaiser and um, they were very good. Mm-hmm. I uh, went there obviously for the accident, but while I was there, we had talked. You know, I talked to him. Well, it was very cold there, and in the urgent care center, there was no heat for some reason. There was the heaters were broken, so it was really cold in there. <laughs> it felt like it was probably forty-five degrees ah. or so. So I was. I have some issues from the long COVID where. Um, when it's cold, I, it gets very painful for me. And so it was very painful in there. And I'd mentioned it to the doctor and he asked me, uh, we talked a little bit about the long COVID and he um, had actually recommended some medications that would be helpful for it. And so I've talked to my doctor and I'm currently trying one of them right now, although it's still too soon to to know. But yeah, I got very good care. There was, they had kind of everything in house, pharmacy, yep. doctors, yep. all of that. Um, That's the thing about Kaiser. And, you know, through my lifetime anyway, it hasn't had like a stellar reputation for being a front runner and, you know, care and all that. But the one thing that you could count on was that everything was there. Yeah. You know, you went to the doctor and if you needed to see a specialist, the specialist was there. You needed medication, the medication was there. Yeah. yeah. They were very quick about everything. Um, Yeah, I think... What, because uh, the, the people I was staying with, a couple of good friends of mine, um, they go to Kaiser for all of their, you know, regular stuff. And what they basically said was, you know, if it, if you have any specialty stuff or, or I guess if you have any major medical stuff, it's not always the best place mm-hmm. to be. But just in general, the regular care is, is very good. And so I, they did very well with me. Certainly the urgent care was great. And um you know, I and wish we had urgent care here. When you get that kind of care, right, mm-hmm. that, that is actually kind of normal care. Yeah. Y- you kind of start scratching your head about what we have to deal with well, here. The biggest difference that I noticed was 
how they responded to me. They were very welcoming. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, they never once made me feel like I was over exaggerating anything or that I was wasting anyone's time. And I, I think sometimes I have, well, a lot of times I have received that type of treatment when I've gone to get care, you know, near here or, I mean, sometimes in Medford, certainly there, there were some providers. Um, but I, I, de I definitely, um, it definitely was a different atmosphere and I very welcoming, you know, yeah. so I appreciated yeah. that. You were not automatically judged to be somehow yeah. inferior because you were young and had a yeah. haircut and had I think mostly just they they, you know, treated me like I was there for an important reason. You know, that it was good that I was being checked out. And isn't that I mean, isn't that the duty of care? Yeah. I, mean, I, I just, you know, it amazes me that that is not the way we are always treated. Yeah. And I've had some good experiences here and, and then some not so great experiences here. And so it's been um, it's been an interesting transformation over the last, you know, 30 plus years that I've been here and yep. seeing the care. So, yep. yeah, we definitely need more providers here. That's oh, right. yeah. A absolutely. lot more. Absolutely. And be nice that they had a place to live. Yes. Just thinking, you know. Yeah. That might actually help. Yeah. They we had a place to live. We definitely well, need that. I'm thrilled that you're still alive. Me too. I would have been devastated had you not come yeah, back. You I'd know. have been pretty upset. That would have been very upsetting. Yeah. Yes. So let's talk about Brookings Core response. Yeah. Because it has been a while. And I think the yeah. last time you were on the show, there was a lot of stuff that was happening. Yeah. Stuff that was still in process. Just yeah. Which is always going to be the case, but... Uh, I feel like I can't keep up with you. I sometimes can't. And certainly sometimes my staff are, you know, when I'm talking about different um, funding we're receiving or, or things like that, you know, if it's, especially if it's not their department, they are having a hard time kind of keeping it straight. <laughs> um, but I will say that it's, even though it seems like it's all going very fast, it's been in the works for a long time. So, yeah. But, you know, long time... It's kind of different for different I guess it feels people. like a long time for me. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, it's only been like three years. I know. Actually, yeah. It's been two and a half years since we were incorporated. And right. So, yeah. And they, I guess it hasn't been like that, that and And that's why I'm, I'm always kind of, I have to make an effort to, you know, close my jaw <laughs> because it's, it has only been three years. And, yeah. And in three years... Brookings Core Response has gone from being an interesting and possibly good idea yeah. to being this nonprofit that's yeah. got how many employees now? We have nine right now. A couple are part time, although one of my part time really it ends up being full time most of the time, and so I'm very grateful for her. She's the newest admin person on my team, and so really, um, she's the executive manager. So she's She's more than an assistant. She really is taking on a lot of tasks, day-to-day -day tasks. But yeah, we have nine staff total and wow. um, are due to include a few more. But there's obviously there's still stuff to work on before we get to that. So. But think about that, right? Three years ago, you weren't, yeah, you weren't even employed, right? Yeah, I was, I was a volunteer, right? <laughs> Actually, I was a first a volunteer at St. Tim's, and then I was employed at St. Tim's. And then put this together and transitioned over. And so I've I've always been a, from our existence, I've always been a staff person at CORE, but started off in, in the work as a volunteer. Yeah. Which is the best way to get your feet wet. It is. Wet. And most wet. of, yeah, yeah most of um, our staff, well, not most, um, most of our volunteers have ended up being staff mm -hmm. um, at some point. So we have a couple of, staff right now, including our most recent, who started as volunteers. And nice. Um, one was a volunteer for the better part of last year. And then we hired her on in, um, I want to say September or October uh, for walk-in services. And then the newest admin, she was a volunteer for over a year and then hired her on. So it is a good way to get your foot in the door. And It is. Um, learn, and to make we're sure that you are a good fit for the business yeah. that you want to yeah, be a part of. Yeah, because it's, uh, 
you know, it's different. It's different work. It's um, it can be really challenging. challenging. Yeah. Um, it can be really rewarding, but we have to be intentional about um recognizing the rewards in it because it's, you know, we don't. We we have a lot of support, but there are also times where we get kind of beat up on both ends, mm-hmm. you know, whether it's community members or leadership or even our clients because they're very frustrated and it's yep. completely understandable. Yep, absolutely. So, uh, I mean, I'm thinking about the, you know, the weather today. If I were out on the street in this yeah. weather, I'd be very unhappy. Yeah. And, you know, that's if you're an otherwise healthy person, but then we have a lot of folks who are elderly and have um, some pretty significant chronic health issues. And so they're um, they're not in crisis necessarily all the time, but it's it definitely affects the mental health a lot. Absolutely. Yeah. And I would think that they would be closer to crisis if they're living on the street than they would be if they were sheltered. And I think the biggest... Um, probably the biggest resource that we're still in need of, and St. Tim's does a lot of this now, is really just having a place for people to be. Mm-hmm. You know, um, we we don't necessarily have space. Well, we don't have space that's our own space. You know, we rent where we're at. And so we have to be really careful about, you know, how long people are hanging out. And, and so it gets difficult because we can't have them hang out all day. Um, it sometimes can cause problems between each other and then with some of our neighbors. And, you know, we have a lot of folks out there who are dealing with mental health issues and substance use and just chronic health conditions that mm-hmm. exacerbate them. So um, we can't always have people hang out. And I think outside of just shelter and housing, people need a place to be. You know, when I was out there on the street, there were very few welcoming places for me. And none of those were really inside somewhere. Hmm. And you can only hang out at the park so long. And I mean, you don't have anything to do. You don't feel like you have a purpose. Um, But if you leave, I mean, if you think about if you were stuck in your car, um, you know, when you get bored, you can't just go drive around because you don't have gas to do that. And so you're you're kind of stuck in this Mm -hmm. rut. And so people need a place to be and they need a place where they're welcomed and where they feel accepted. And um, that's hard. It's amazing to me that that is even a thing mm. that we talk about, that people yeah. need a place where they, of course they do. Yeah. Of course we do. Yeah. And there's there's places in other communities that um, are really great like that. And some, I mean, not even just for people who are out on the street, but in Medford, there is... Um, a compass house, which is you can go there and hang out all day. It's sort of a clubhouse for people who have um, mental health disorders. And I think you just bring proof one time and they kind of file it away. And then it's, you know, you're there and you're in and you can be there around people who are dealing with the same issues or similar issues and um, very welcoming. And I've seen it, you know, I've been over there a few times. And so, and they have Maslow for families who have um, are dealing with homelessness and you can kind of be there throughout the day and, you know, they have food and stuff. So just a, a place to be is really, yep. sh- really should be the first step yep. towards housing and shelter. Yep. Exactly. So let's talk about, you know, some of your stuff because you've got, I can't even begin to name how many different programs you've got yeah. going on, but, you know. And sometimes it's, uh, it's hard for sometimes me to. you can't remember. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Because some of the programs are not quite launched yet, and so it's hard to, you know, really talk about them. But we we do, we've always had the resource navigation, which is sort of our, our case management. Mm-hmm. And um, right now, we've sort of taken the housing focus out of there. There's still a, a little bit, but for the most part, the resource navigation is sort of the medical um, case management. And then we have um, our walk-in services, which is Peer House, mm-hmm. and we we would like to well, we are currently looking for a building and funding to get us into something where we can have a um, those walk-in services where people are able to come in and be for a little while and, and sort of hang out. Um, but last year, we served about 3,800 people. Wow. Uh, not 3,800 people, excuse me. We served about just over 500 people, but we provided 3,800 services, mm-hmm. walk-in services. Um, so Peer House is still running. That's um, all of our walk-in stuff. 
resource navigation is, was our case management last year, and this year we've expanded to many other case management programs. Um, so resource navigation is really the health case management. And then we have um, rapid rehousing is just starting up here soon, and that's you know getting people into housing. So it's housing case management. Mm-hmm. Um, homeless prevention is something that we'll have going as well, and we're we're going to be putting all of these on the website so people can read more about it and know how to access these programs. What's your website? Uh, it's at BrookingsCoreResponse.org. So if if anybody if you go there, you'll see a list of all of our services and. Um, staff, you can read about us and and board. Um, <laughs> yeah, I need to make sure I get everybody on there. Um, so so resource or rapid rehousing, homeless prevention, those are kind of the housing focused. We do have low income housing opening this later this year, and that's veterans housing um, in Gold that Beach. Up in Gold Beach, yeah, that's yeah. in Gold Beach. Mm-hmm. It's uh, currently in process and then we're going to begin construction hopefully in the next couple of months mm-hmm. um we were hoping to have that closed by the end of january but it is quite the process um and it sounds like this is pretty common you know mm-hmm. i'm working with other agencies around the state that are kind of on, on the same track and um it just it's quite the it's quite the process for everybody involved wow there's so many consultants and lawyers and wow um you know, our developers, uh, which is Adam with AB Innovations, he's been key in all of this and really helping get everything off the ground. So we have that. And then we'll have um, some transitional housing that could open in the spring, um, but it could take us until summer to make sure we get all those contracts in place. And transitional is where you help somebody get a permanent place, but yeah. they've got a place to stay until... Yeah, and I just heard that the rules were changed. It used to be that someone could stay in transitional housing for up to two years, but it sounds like through the state, and I need to verify this, but it sounds like it may have changed to one year, mm. which I think they're just trying to motivate getting people right. permanently housed sooner so that you're not... Stuck. And I mean, that's fine as long as there's yeah. actually a house to go to. Right. That's the concern for a lot of transitional housing providers yeah. is, you know, okay, if we if we create this transitional housing, we're, we're stuck with this one-year deadline to get them in, and mm-hmm. we can't control the housing market to, right. to some extent. You know, right. obviously, you know, we can go after low-income housing, and mm-hmm. and uh, and I hope that our agency continues to increase affordable housing in the area. I know um, Adam is... Uh, that's part of his mission, you know, Great. is to develop affordable housing. Mm-hmm. We are currently over 500 units short for affordable housing in Curry County. So, you know, we can only control so much of the housing market. And so transitional housing is a little bit um, scary to kind of step into mm-hmm. in some respect, but it's a needed step. You know, right. um, some people really need the transitional piece. They've got legal stuff to work out. They've got to work on increasing their income. Right. So. I think it's probably um, important that we get transitional housing here in Curry County and especially in Brookings. So, Well, and you know, when you think about it, there are so many people that were born and raised here who cannot afford to continue to live here. Yeah. They can't afford the rent. They certainly can't get into the housing market. I mean, it's just... It, it, this is a very rough time for people. It is. And it is. So I, I know, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, some things um, took place. There was a lot of increase in short-term rentals during that time because, you know, you couldn't get into motels. You couldn't, mm-hmm. there was a lot of um, tourism slowed down. And I think that that was an opportunity for investors to, you know, skirt around that in some respect. Mm-hmm. And so the market was down enough and um, people were sitting on money. And so that was a really good time for them to invest in a lot of housing. Um, But unfortunately, a lot of it transitioned to short-term rental. And, you know, I saw it happening. A lot of us saw it happening. And we are just now feeling the effects of some of these changes that started four years ago. So... Um, I mean, on my street alone, I've I've seen it happening. And and I know that those, those homes used to be inhabited by a family Mm -hmm. and they aren't anymore they're not available they are now basically for tourism and i've seen the the um 
attitude change online too. And we, you know, when you look in the local groups, um, it used to be that when people would post rentals, um, they there would be a lot of people jumping on there, tagging their friends to get in. Mm-hmm. And now what we see is a lot of people getting on there and they're upset. And they're saying, you know, they're they're saying things like, you know, that the rent is too high and, and all of that. And it, and it does seem very high. Well, $2,000 mm-hmm. a month for something that, you know. Yeah, there's one bedrooms going for 2000 a month. It's crazy. And And I know that it's just the way the market is right now, but I think that we need to pay attention to the attitude of, of the people that is... Um, it's changed quite a bit. Um, more and more people are noticing it. And even if they're not directly affected, somebody they know is. And mm-hmm. so I do think that it's important that we keep an eye on that and that we pay attention to that. Because yep. um, as we know, you know, the will of the people does it does, does move make, mountains yes, sometimes. it does. It um, makes itself known. Yeah. Yes. And I have not seen a lot of positive responses on rentals online. I think there are landlords even afraid to post theirs online. Mm. Um, and so that isn't a great dynamic to right. have in a community. Well, we have, you know, gone in front of the planning commission many times yeah. and basically begged them to not keep converting single family dwellings into short-term rentals. Yeah, that's that's one piece of it for yep. sure. And it's a big one right now. We we can't afford to lose any units. No. Um, but there's more mm-hmm. that we need to pay attention to. And I think that what I've seen in Oregon is uh, specifically since um, Governor Kotek has come in is the desire to increase housing mm-hmm. and not just the desire, but the funding to back it up. Right. There's been a lot of increase in funding to to build housing. There's been a lot of, um, there's been some executive orders signed to deliver funding to the counties. And that's amazing because mm-hmm. really that is what it takes. It, yeah. That you, it takes, you can say, oh, I yeah. want you to do it, but unless you push yeah. the money. Unless there's funding behind it, yeah. there's virtually no, we're, especially nonprofits and, you know, housing authorities as well. Yeah are very underfunded. And so unless there's a significant flow of funding going towards housing, it doesn't mean anything to just um, say that we want more housing. Right. So I, I've i seen a lot of it and more than I've ever seen with any of our governors. I mean, I realize I'm young. And so there's probably been, been times before where we've had a good response like this and had a lot of building. But this is another... Um, Another moment in time where I think yeah. we're going to see some building happening. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited. Yeah, it's um, absolutely great. So, so we have you know the low income housing that we're going to get off the ground later this year, and the transitional housing, um, and we do have an emergency shelter, although that that will end. Um, at, That's uh, a winter shelter, right? Winter shelter, and there's the coalition has one. We have one, and um, that ends March 31st. And you're full. We are full. In fact, we expanded to 12 rooms from 10 rooms because we had the funding to do so. So um, we currently have, I think, 15 individuals in 12 in, in the 12 rooms because there are a few families in there. So that's and we're we're really pushing towards getting them into housing before this is up, because, you know, last year, I think we were able to get three into housing out of the 10 rooms. And uh, that was very difficult. And this year, we we want to increase that quite a bit. So that's our. You're not actually housing everybody who needs housing in this shelter, right? No, gosh, no. There's, um, you know, I don't know how many people signed up for shelter last year. We had 75 people sign up for 10 beds, Um, and some of those were people we hadn't even seen in our office before. So, Mm -hmm. you know, there are more people out there, and um, we've seen an increase in walk-in services too. So we know that there's, we know there are people who are hearing of services and starting to come in Mm -hmm. that haven't utilized our services before. And probably St. Tim's seeing the same, food banks probably seeing the same. Um, So yeah, there's, it. this is the time where we do see an increase in requests for service Mm -hmm. because of the weather. Yeah. Um, In the summer, sometimes we can see influxes in people um, coming here to get out of the heat. So it's really interesting yeah. how we see these influxes um, 
and then it kind of dies down and then we see another influx when the weather changes. Right. So <laughs> it's interesting. I know. <laughs> So you've had lots of agencies that have contributed towards making yeah. you the success that Yeah, we have some really um we have some funders that I think have stuck with us from the very beginning and some new ones that have um recognized the work we're doing. Uh I know, you know, from the beginning, All Care and Advanced Health, which are our two CCOs in the area. And CCO stands for? The Coordinated Care Organization. Yeah. So they are Medicaid providers. So if somebody has organ health plan, they will typically, unless they have open card or they came here from out of the area, um, they will have All Care or they will have Advanced Health. And they both provide care coordination. They both provide a lot of flexible funding. Um, you know, they have really great coverage. Obviously, if you have OHP, you don't pay anything out of pocket. Um, and so what they also provide is not just health insurance, but they provide funding to CBOs, which is a community-based organization um, like us. And they have really stepped up their support over the years for Curry County. And that includes us. They were some of our first funders. In fact, I think Advanced Health um, gave us somewhere around $6,600 our first year, which, you know, I, I look back now and um, that was a lot at the time. It was a big deal. It was. It yes. got us um, to some technology for outreach. It yeah. got us, you know, paid for our insurance stuff, and it provided some um, some of our outreach items. And so, um, and All Care likewise gave us a grant initially to help pay for our case managers. And um, so they have been with us from the beginning. Um, Humble Area Foundation also was with us from the beginning. Um, there's been so many, and then there's been several along the way who've provided small amounts of support. Um, Coke Hill Tribe gave us some, the Curry Health Network, or Curry Health Foundation um, gave us a small grant for some of our health programs and case management last year. But recently, we've um, we've been able to receive funding and larger amounts of funding from um, Lake Oregon Health Authority. We we were part of the Measure 110, or we are part of the Measure 110 initiative, and so we we've been receiving funding from them the last year and a half, and that has been renewed for another year and a half. Excellent. Um, and that that essentially covers all of our walk-in services, all of Mirror House, Ooh. and then um, Cambia Health Foundation has stepped in in a big way to help with our health programs. Um, we were able to get street medicine going. We now have a medical director. That's another program. <laughs> I met her uh, the other day. Too. Yeah, Autumn yeah, she's is lovely. Wonderful. She's so lovely. And oh. and Bree, which is their CEO, she's yeah, she's yeah. also delightful. Yeah, they've been. Yeah, they uh, both gave wrote me a little note. I it's, know, it's aren't they so sweet? So sweet. Yeah. She she texts me every once in a while and checks in on me and and all of that. So um, and that program for people who don't know is um, something we've recently incorporated into our resource navigation. Um, so street medicine is something we've wanted to do for a long time. And um, we've been working, sort of having these conversations with the hospital the last year about hospital consultation. And that is going into the hospitals for people who are going to discharge either to the street or to their house with no support and um, offering them, you know, two months of follow-up support, case management, nice. making sure they get their needs met. And um, And we're working on trying to get some medical respite in our transitional house so that Sometimes we can discharge them to the medical respite. But there was a piece missing, which was the street medicine, the actual care that we wanted to provide, um, you know, for people who don't have a primary care or, or who don't go see their primary care, um, because there are a lot of hoops here to jump through. And, you know, I myself, I saw my provider in April and then wasn't able to see him again until just a, a few weeks ago. That's insane. It is. I mean, so, it's just crazy. So street medicine has been pretty uh, pretty transformative in that we can get people in same day or next day with this telehealth provider. And she does come over here every couple of weeks um, mm -hmm. and uh, it's sees people on site. It's important. I mean, yeah. you know, we talk about the availability of doctors yeah. and, you know, being able to get medical care. And but we talk about it as if it, uh, it's no big deal. But yeah, it's huge. Oh, it's it's a big deal. Um, me not being able to see my provider um, and not being able to get in, you know, really did lead to me being hospitalized over the holiday break. And and I know how to navigate systems, and I know how to take 
care of, you know, of myself in that way. But it wasn't a matter of, you know, me not contacting my provider and me not taking the steps. It was just not there. It was not, yeah. it, it, I wasn't able to get in. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, we have people who end up in, in the emergency room for no reason other than they, they should have seen a provider. And so we've been able to mitigate some of that. Um, I don't know how many appointments we've had so far, but, um, you know, at least five or six, I think. And that's just started in the last few weeks. So, so yeah, it's and been... most of it's telehealth, right? Most of it's, well, yeah, most of it's telehealth. Mm -hmm. um, she did come on site when, you know, when you met her, mm -hmm. she was here over here for the day and saw a few, a few patients then, and she'll be back, I think, next week or the following week. I can't quite remember. Mm -hmm. um, so, but that's, that is all possible because Cambia Health uh, approached us and said that they wanted to help improve health services here. So that has launched now and hopefully will lead into the hospital consultation and the medical respite. And really, um, all three of those programs together will will help a person who's going to the emergency room or trying to not go to the emergency room all the way to their discharge and follow-up care. So um, Yeah, I can't imagine if, if you were, for instance, having surgery done or something and, and you lived by yourself. Yeah, uh, and, and if get you don't discharged have discharged back yeah. to your home, and there's nobody there to, and most people, you know, especially if you have uh, wound care needs or something like mm -hmm. that, you know, there there is um, home health that will follow up if you require it. You can get discharged to a skilled nursing facility for mm -hmm. extended care, but for those who don't qualify for those two things, and because they really, you know, it's something that if you had a family member at home, they could easily provide. It's not right. non medical. But if you don't have a family member, the hospitals don't, well, it's not even so much the hospitals. Our healthcare system in general doesn't take that into account. Yep. And so you, you really do get discharged home, um, and it could exacerbate things where you end up back in the ER. Yep. Or you don't follow up with your provider or your care because it's too difficult. So it's just kind of a, um, you know, the, the CCOs, the coordinated care organizations, they already do a lot of this. Um, but it is difficult when they don't have the staffing necessarily in place here in Curry mm -hmm. County. So this would be a way for us to come alongside them and provide a lot of hands-on and with very trained providers and um, case managers that have been doing this for a while. So That's excellent! it's a great program. We're really grateful to Cambia. Um, and I think, you know, hopefully we're going to continue on with them to be able to provide more and more services and increase services here. So. It's interesting to me because I, I've been hearing, you know, for years, at least three years, maybe longer, that, you know, the, the unsheltered should just move on because we don't have any services here. And the reality is that the task is to provide the services. The task yes. is to bring the services, not get rid of the people because you don't have them. Because nowhere has the, all the answers. Right. And so we have to do the we have to do what we can to increase that and we have to do what we can to prov to fill the need, not to move them on to where we think the needs can be filled. Plus it it actually makes our whole community better. Yeah. I mean it it actually absolutely lifts the level of the water for all the boats. Yes. Right. I mean, you get more services here. Yes. You have more services. We've I remember going to the emergency room one time. This was maybe a year ago. Maybe it was more than that even. Um, and there was uh, an elderly woman there with her husband who she was having chest pain and needed to get seen. And um they the beds were full and they were having a hard time getting her back in a timely manner. And he was getting understandably upset because, mm -hmm. you know, this is his wife and she desperately needs to get hooked up to monitors and, and be seen because this could be very serious. Yep. And um, they just didn't have a bed right at the moment. And so you think about if we had more providers, if we had more safety nets, how many of those beds would have been empty? And so I think people don't realize the secondary effect or what they see it as is the the fault of the individuals who have no ability to change the system. Right. And that doesn't make any sense. You cannot fault someone who's in the emergency room because they couldn't get to a provider um, for 
the lack of beds. Yep. You really need to take a systems approach to this. But we don't think about it that way. It's And it's a heavy lift. Mm -hmm. So what can we, the one individual person, do? And, um, you know, some of us can do quite a bit, Mm -hmm. obviously. You know, I'm getting in there and trying to get as much funding for programs as possible. But even individuals who aren't able to do what I'm doing, they can volunteer in other ways. They can help out. They can um, support these programs. They can speak out in favor. And that moves the needle. And it you know, as again, as we've seen, public opinion weighs heavy. Yep. Um, and it does move the needle. Yep. And so I would ask that people get involved mm-hmm. and, um, you know, become a part of the solution as opposed to turning around, turning away from it. And then right. you are also negatively affected by it when you turn away. It doesn't yep. go away. Yep. Yep. So Because someday you may very well need the exact service. Yes. That if you just were pushing a little bit would already be here. Or, you know, you may need a service that seems totally reasonable for you to have, like going to the ER because you're having chest pain and not realizing that those services that you were pushing away and those services that you were um, slamming and and saying that were not helpful. And they may be the very services that could have helped open up those beds. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's all tied together. It's, it is. It's amazing that we don't actually recognize that. Yeah. That we don't look for the ways that it's all tied together. We are all a community here. Yeah. We are all a part of this community. And we all have an effect on each other that we don't realize. And, you know, they talk about the seven degrees of separation. And I was... Six. Six degrees of separation. Yeah. E- even still. <laughs> um, I was talking to my kids about this not long ago. And... This is a very interesting jump here. But mm-hmm. um, so I am in have connection with um, an individual at the in Salem mm-hmm. who has a connection with our governor, who has a connection with our president. So I'm three degrees separated from our president. Wow. Who has a connection with Vladimir Putin. <laughs> I am four <laughs> degrees separation from Vladimir Putin. Who has a connection with some random person in the middle of nowhere in Russia? I'm connected to this person in less than six degrees separation. That's insane. Yeah. So w- here in this wow. community in Brookings, in this tiny town, yeah, we are very connected. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly. And we need to act like it. Yeah. Yeah. Because what what is good for somebody is good for us all. Yeah. And who knows? You you could affect Vladimir Putin. You don't even know. <laughs> <laughs> It's or interesting. that random person out that in That random Siberia. person, yeah, just <laughs> minding their own business that only knows 20 people. Well, one of them knows someone that knows someone that knows me. That's so, fascinating, yeah. isn't it? It really is. And so everything we do um, affects the world in some way, and it certainly affects our world here in Curry County. And I know that, that part of the um, some of the Native American philosophies are about seven generations. So they they look ahead seven yes. generations. So what they do should benefit not just their yes. children, not just their children's children, but seven generations ahead. I There's a saying, um, the best way to affect the life of a child is a hundred to start a hundred years ago. It's something, yep. something like that. Yep. And um, that's absolutely true. And, and, you know, and just biologically, again, this is just kind of a little side thing, but, you know, my my grandmother, it was in her womb that yeah. I got my DNA. Yes. Yeah. So it's like, what? Because your, your mother was made with all the eggs she was going to have in life, right? which was you. Yeah. And so you yeah. you so were there. Weird. Yeah. It's so weird. Um, which is why. connected, right? Which is why they talk about, um, you know, what we do when we're pregnant, not just affects the health of our child, but the health of our grandchildren. Right. And so, you know, it's fascinating. It's, it's, Im- it's important. Yeah. 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 How we take care of our community and our, our neighbors. And Absolutely. Who knows what their children, their grandchildren are going to grow up to be. And yeah. so it's, yeah. So future stuff. Yeah. What have you got? Gosh, we're I mean, talk about the future. Okay. Right. I, well, you know, we might as well. Right? Yeah. So you've gone, again, you've gone from like an idea 
mm-hmm. with like no budget because it wasn't even a thing. Yeah. To being happy about sixty six hundred dollars. Exactly. Yeah. Actually, our first, the very first donation we ever got, the very first amount of money we ever got as an organization, was three hundred dollars to pay our registration fee for uh, the state and all wow. of that, and kind of just get the first paperwork started. Yeah. And I remember getting that three hundred dollar check, thinking like, "Wow, yeah, right, so great, right, yeah. exactly." Yeah. So your budget now for 2024 is... Well, 2024 is a bit of an anomaly because we're getting the motel. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's going to be somewhere close to $5 million, but that's really because... $5 this, million. Yeah, dollars. Because of this uh, motel project, that's certainly... And who knows, next year we may go for another. That would be ideal. Mm-hmm. Um Although we'll see how much energy I have at the end of this year. Um, <laughs> well, don't get COVID again, okay? Yeah. And don't get in another automobile yeah. accident. For, for those oh. who don't know, I'm, I'm um, Candace it said I look less than wonderful, and I'm paraphrasing here. Um, yeah. When I walked yes. in today, <laughs> I was a lot more excited. Yeah. So, and I'm I'm hanging in, but I'm very tired today. So, yeah. Um, yeah so, future, um, we. We expect that we'll probably have close to a million dollar ish budget in in the future, um, just because of some of the housing. I also didn't mention Oregon Housing and Community Services as as one of our major funders now. And what's great about them is, um, and this is something I I actually didn't know until maybe last Friday, or maybe it was even before then, somewhere around a week ago, um, that we might be. Um, I say might because this is what I'm hearing from a lot of our partners. Um, we might be the first agency based in Curry County to receive direct funding from Oregon Housing and Community Services for these housing programs. Not necessarily low income housing because obviously a lot of there's there's low income housing already here in Curry County, but regarding um, rapid rehousing and homeless prevention and and all of that. So this is interesting to me. And the groundbreaking, yeah. And the great news is that it it definitely um, is funding that typically you can receive year after year. So this feels Excellent. to be a, a good, um, steady source of resources for our community. And we certainly anticipate continuing on with these programs. Um, so that said, and again, having mm-hmm. that money coming into the county means that the money yes. is in the county because it typically goes right. to community action agencies, and there are three serving our community. I think, I think two who, who historically um, has been Orca, but Class, which is um, gosh, I, I Klamath and Lake County um, Community Action or something like that. I'm probably incorrect on that. Butchering that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, maybe it's Klamath Community Action. So either way, um, so CLASS is serving our community currently and has been for a while, and we've been very grateful to them. Uh, we've been able to um, send a lot of individuals to them for um, rapid rehousing services and rental assistance and whatnot. And ORCA has served our community in the past, but they're all based outside of the community they they have offices here typically, but, you know, I think that having an agency where when the funding comes to us, it does, not a dollar of it gets diverted to another county. And so yeah. that's been really, that's been really nice and, and reassuring for a lot of our partners Good. and um, the people using our services. Good. So yeah. we hope to increase that and expand it and um, be sort of an anchor for that. I think a lot of agencies will be able to be recipients in the future and we'll be able to kind of share the load. Um, but right now we're really grateful just to get that and get it going. So, yeah. And we're working with a lot of our partners pretty closely, including um, the coalition in Gold Beach and Neighbors to Neighbors in Port Orford to make sure that, you know, it's equitable amongst mm-hmm. the entire county and not just here in Brookings. So that's going to be really important. Good. Excellent. So that's, um, you know, kind of some of the future. Uh, right now, we're really focused on uh, the point in time count, which is a oh, that's big next event. Next week, isn't it? It's next week. Oh, yes. Holy so, holy. point in time count is our census that we do for HUD. It happens all across the country on one week of the year, and we typically try to pick the same date as most other counties and states, just because 
you know, you don't want to count someone, then have them go to a different county and get counted again. It's really trying to get a snapshot, right. just as, as you would with any census. Right. Um, so a census is typically done every 10 years, but the point in time count, um, because we're tracking how many people are without housing, we try to do it every two years. Um, in fact, it's mandatory every two years. So that that is next week. It's the largest event for most homeless service agencies. It's and all hands on deck. How do you do that? How do you how well do you count people who are not don't yeah. have a place still live? Yeah. Right. So there's uh, two things. There's the housing inventory count, the HIC count, and then there is the point in time count, which is for counting people who are without shelter. Um, there's the sheltered and unsheltered count. And so sheltered is how many people are in using shelter in your community, which we have, you know, 15. And I think Beth has 12 with the coalition. Um, so they'll get counted in a separate uh, way. But um, what we do is we set up stations at different agencies. In uh, Brookings, we have the food bank running theirs Monday, Wednesday and Friday of next week. I think 10 to 1 is their hours. And then St. Timothy's is going to run all five days next week from 9 to 1. And uh, Brookings Core Response will run Monday through Thursday, um, 9 to 1. And then we have what's called the brush count. So for the three stations, people come to um, the building. They take a survey with one of our staff or volunteers. We have incentives. So we, we were able to put together some really cool bags. Um, there's dry bags so that they are waterproof. Ah, okay. And they're filled with various items. Um, and then... Uh, we have so we have the brush count, which is where we actually go out on foot and count um, all of the people that are unable to make it to one of the centers or maybe don't know of the centers um, who, or who are just out there. We can do it by taking the survey or, you know, if they don't want to do the survey, which the survey is very um, it's de-identified. So there's no actual, you know, their name doesn't get tracked or anything. It's it's actually by initials and date of birth. And that's just to make sure that there's no duplicates because it's pretty random to have someone with the same initials, same date of birth, same demographics. Right. So it gets screened out that way by the state. And it's done on an app now. I remember when it used to be oh. pen and paper. Yeah. And um, I remember one time getting it all done. And the last one I did at the night, this is in Jackson County, and I must have had 40 papers that day. I, ca I was out quite a bit. Wow. And um, I set the pack on top of my car and almost started to drive off. Well, I started to drive off and then realized it was up there and I would have lost, you know, 40 papers. Wow. So, um, and the reason it's important is because funding. Yes. This funds. Right. So low income housing, how much, you know, funding is allocated for our HUD vouchers, for mm -hmm. instance, that's a big deal. Section E, um, how much, so when this, this shelter funding got pushed out, they looked at our numbers. Hmm. When um, the rapid rehousing funding got pushed out to us, they looked at our numbers for pig count. Right. And so these executive orders that the governor is signing, that's what they base their numbers off of. So it's actually quite important. It's the, critical. What, yeah. Next, and we next wish there were right. more accurate ways. This is as accurate as we can get. We right. do miss people sometimes. That does happen. But um, we just get better and better every year. Do you have enough volunteers? We have a lot of volunteers. Excellent. Yes. We had, I think, 30 people sign up. Wow. And so we split them between St. Timothy's and CORE. Food Bank had a few. They, they're they mostly going to be directing people to us. Mm -hmm. And then we'll hit the brush count with, I think I have five teams of cars wow. for the brush count. So wow. um, I'm a little concerned about the weather. You know, yeah. And if it's like this. Yeah. This is, a, well, are you still going to go out? Absolutely. If, wow. Um, we'll go out. We'll hit the river roads. We'll hit mm -hmm. camps that we mm -hmm. are aware of and are able to find. And um, it's well coordinated. It's well mm -hmm. planned out. And um, this year, I was able to kind of take lead for Curry. But I really am, obviously, I'm down here in Brookings. So, you know, Beth is focused on Gold Beach. And Neighbors to Neighbors is really focused on Port Orford. And they've, they've all got... Um, you know, we, we've all been doing this for a while, so we're all very coordinated. Um, and so I was able to help with get St. Timothy's and Food Bank um, and Brush Count coordinated with, with our building as well. So it's, you know, we, we will have maps, we'll have teams, we'll have um, everybody is pretty skilled or we'll be able to train them before we all head out. Um, and we had a lot of people volunteer for Brush Count that are familiar with the population and familiar with the area. Mm -hmm. 
our resource officer, some of our mental health staff is involved. Oh, great. Yeah. Um, and and um, from the CCOs as well. So, mm-hmm. you know, they're, they're, they're familiar with the terrain. So in terms of the brush count, how do you have a sense of how many you've had in the past? I mean, with brush count here, um, we don't get as many with brush count here because thankfully they're they're pretty aware of services. So they and word by mouth, you know, they it spreads. So right. they know when there's um, whenever we're doing events and there's incentive bags and things that we really can get out to the people like. They tell each other about it. And mm-hmm. so we, we get an influx of people coming into the building, which is what we want. Good. You know, we have many, many volunteers to, to handle that flow. And we won't have all of our regular services. I imagine um, St. Tim's will probably have, um, you know, they'll probably have their showers and meals and things like that. But it'll be a little bit difficult to do some of the case management services. Right. So it'll really be all hands on deck for this. Mm-hmm. So the brush count, you know, we may hit 10 to 20 Okay. Um, depending on how far out up the rivers we go. Right. And because uh, we got several last count. Well, the last count I had COVID. So the count before that, I should say. Right. We we had several. So. Um, and that's great. I mean, you know, because those those folks can't, for whatever reason, can't get to yeah. a place. So well, there's a lot of people kind of stuck up river that are only able to get to town once a month or a couple mm-hmm. times a month. So. Um, so we'll bring well, it's five. rough if you don't have a car, yeah, right, or you have a car, but you've only got a certain amount of gas, yeah, no, absolutely that's that's why they only come in you know once a month when they know they have a way to get more income or right. more funding, right. so which makes sense so we've we've got our areas, and we're all very familiar with um where people are typically at, mm-hmm. so um we're gonna break up based off of where um you know the resource officer obviously will stay in Brookings because she's very familiar with the what's her areas. Name? That's Sophia. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, Lucero. She's right. She's I great. I think I've met her. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, she's been at a lot of the meetings, actually. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So you've probably seen her there. Um, so she's going to go, I think, with one of the mental health um, members or team great. team members. And then I'll be out there with our, our CCO liaison. <laughs> so I'm excited. We're, we're going to take the long shift. Nine, it'll be about, no, it'll be about 10 a.m. to 9 p.m. is when I'll be out. So you're kidding? No, that's a most lot won't of hours. do the full shift, but M- Melissa's um, going to hang in there with me. Oh my god! So, yeah. Oh my god! Yeah, I, I we'll I have fun and big, big no to that. We'll yeah. have fun in my Subaru. <laughs> yeah. Well, we are running out of time, yeah. as you know, as we always do. Yeah. Amazingly enough, it does end. Yeah. Yeah. So if somebody wants to get in touch with you for any reason. Yeah, they. How can, do they do that? Uh, they can give us a call. That's the the best way is to just come in. We're out located in the Harbor Shopping Center, um, the upper shopping center, not where the DMV's at, but above it, mm-hmm. right next to Bud Mart. So nine seven nine zero zero Shopping Center Avenue, Unit thirty one in out in Harbor, or you can give us a call. That's the next best way five four one two five one zero eight two five, or you can go on our website. We've got a lot of ways to reach us on the website. So that's BrookingsCoreResponse dot org. Diana, thank you so much. I mean, yeah. it's a delight to having you back, and I'm glad you're still alive. Me and too. In peace, so, you know, and thank yeah. you for the work that you do. It yeah. really makes a difference. Yeah, thank you. And I want to thank you for tuning in. Often, it really does take a village. Thanks for being part of ours. I'm Candace Michelle, and this is Our Community. Our Community.